Rise with Feldman, the first one in 2021. Wishing you all a happy new year and a great 2021. Hopefully somewhat less uh, hectic than 2020. Anyway, today's topic um, is an interest of all of mine, and I'm really the people who are joining me, it's really a, an honor. Today will be a little bit different. Today I asked three people to join me, actually four, but only three could make it because, and I'll, I'll explain that in a minute, but um, three people will be discussing the first year of life in arthrogryposis. And that's important because as a surgeon, I don't usually get involved in arthrogryposis surgery until the child, somewhere between the age of one and a half to three. And the first year of life and that first year and a half of life are so crucial to how the child is treated. Your child's gonna look the worst when they're born. And it's very scary. And so how do you approach that and so I have three experts with me today, and I'm going to sit back and listen to them talk about these topics. So today, we're going to talk about arthrogryposis the first year. With me, I have Dr. Guardo, who heads our entire physical therapy department here at Bailey Institute. And I have, as well have Nelda Posada, who's been working as an occupational therapy with these AMC kids for as long as I've been here, and really diligent every day about how she makes her splints and works with the upper extremities and does that. And Del Frederico is a very, very experienced physical therapist with these children who's worked diligently also in making these outcomes for these kids before and after surgery as best as they possibly um, can be. So I'm going to introduce Fran, and then Fran's going to go from there um, in discussing uh, the different topics to go. So Fran, please take it away, and I will remask myself as we do this. And I will unmask. Greetings. Um, I'm going to just really briefly mention that Mary Beck, who is also an occupational therapist who is not able to join us today, but she actually pioneered a lot of the um, techniques that we've expounded upon um, in the upper extremity. So um, she has been very involved in things a little bit earlier, and um, we're very grateful for her influence. So here you can see some of the things that we do and use in the first year of life. As Dr. Feldman said, the babies look the worst when they're first born, and um, they're the stiffest. They, the deformities are most pronounced at that point in time. They've been packaged very tightly uh, in the womb, and um, our goal as they come out is to get them moving. Um, they can look a variety of different ways, which we'll discuss as we get further along. Um, our philosophy here is we want to get them moving and unlock them as quickly as possible. So um, kind of the earlier we get babies, the better. Um, we love it when they come to us within the first month of life. It does not have to be the first week of life, but uh, within the first four to eight weeks of life is very helpful and um, we can get them going. However, many people don't find us until their babies are a little bit older and um, we can work with them any age and we still use the same techniques. It's just sometimes a little bit easier as we get them a little bit younger. So um, here's a hand splint. You'll see more of these throughout. These are some of the stretches that we start with and um, casting. So did I go too? Um, we're just going to go with that. Okay, so these are some of the presentations that you can see. Many, many babies with um, arthrogryposis have club feet. Um, most of them have some type of upper extremity involvement. You can see all three of these kids do. And um, most of them have some type of contractures also in either their knees or their hips. Some knees are contracted or stiff, st um, straight, and they don't bend, and some are are contracted very, very flexed. Um, and you can also see um, in this hip, we've got, uh, they're stiff into flexion. And this one is very, very stiff into flexion. And this little one has normal legs. Um, and all three have upper extremity. Okay, so how do we unlock them? Because we've talked about they're locked in when they're first born. And how do we do that? Well, early intervention is the key. So physical therapy, like Dr. Feldman said, occupational therapy, often we use techniques such as serial casting and serial splinting. So what does that mean? Um, serial casting is a technique where 
just like we say, serial, one, then the other, then the other, then the other. So we get a little bit more motion with um, the first cast and stretches and hold that for a few days. And then you take that off and then you do it all over again and you're serially or sequentially getting a little bit more motion and a little bit more motion and holding it with the next cast or the next splint. Once you get the maximal correction, then you want to brace to hold it. And why do we brace? Because you can take it off and on and you can do range of motion and movement in between. So movement, movement, movement is the key to unlocking them. How do we achieve motion? Well, first we have to get passive motion in order to get active motion. We don't always know what these babies have. They did not read Gray's Anatomy when they were being formed sometimes. Sometimes they're missing muscles, but we kind of assume that they have them until proven differently. So first we want to unlock them and it's really quite phenomenal to see what begins to move. So. Um, first, we get passive range of motion, and we don't do big, huge stretches because you can actually damage. We do little, small, progressive ones. So each stretch gets just a little bit more motion, um, and then you hold prolonged stretches and then braces. We can use modalities. Dale, you want to come in and, and talk to uh, talk to them about the modalities just a little bit. Sure. Hi everybody, I'm Dale Federico, and I'm really happy to, and honored to be here and happy to be able to work with this specific patient population with such a talented surgeon. Um, I am also here to help, I was a physical therapist or have been for over 20 years. 17 years before I came here, I had never had the opportunity to work with these types of children. And honestly, they would have scared me. So I know that your area of physical therapist might look at your child and think, oh, you know, there, there's not much I can do with them. Um, because when they present in such severe contractures, they, they really are afraid to touch them. And what I have learned over time in being here at the Paley Institute is that we have to get in there. And all of the things that we've learned in lengthening our patients that we see here at the Paley Institute and ways to help increase passive range of motion, we just apply to these itty bitty babies and we're seeing amazing results. I mean, these children come in and can't move at all. And um, so some of the modalities that we're using are physical therapy modalities that you're using with other uh, patient populations. So um, I often use a hot pack, a moist hot pack with extra padding. I always, always, I'm very into using my hands and the manual te uh, techniques, whatever you have um, or your area therapist has in their toolkit. Um, um, soft tissue and um, even deeper tissue and also using ASTEM, which is an instrument assisted soft tissue technique that we use. Um, but a lot of the other things that your other therapists at home are using for other patients can easily be applied to this population. So again, like Fran said, it's gaining passive range of motion before achieving active range of motion. And things that we do to achieve active range of motion is adding electrical stimulation. So even on our tiny, tiny babies, we're using neuromuscular um, electrical stimulation um, on quad muscles, on wrist extensors, um, you know, on, I've even had it on pecs and biceps um, and, you know, trying to get cross-bodied. So um, a lot of the things that your therapists have used need to be applied to this baby. And I think they need to be encouraged to not be so afraid mm -hmm. because it is really intimidating um, for the therapist to see these, chi these children. But what we have found and what we have seen, which you're gonna see in some of these pictures coming up, are really just astounding, the changes that you can make in these babies. They're pliable, they need to be moved, they need to be stretched, we need to be pushing. And I know how Fran said, we need to be gentle. I wanna just say it's gentle, but it's progressive. It's not like, if the baby's not squirming and they're not feeling it, then you're not changing anything, is kind of the way I look at it. So they need to be a little squirmy, and you know, they might be crying and uncomfortable, um, and it's definitely something that over time you learn through the feeling in your hands what your baby has and then trying to get just that little bit more. Thank you. 
Okay, so trunk and spine. The trunk and spine can be normal. Um, they can have scoliosis or kyphosis or contractures or just stiffness. Almost all of them have some, some level of torticollis. You can look at these babies here, or this baby, sorry, this is one. This is her within the, uh, before she came to us actually, and this is her tummy time. Her back was so tight that her hips were off the ground most of the time, of tummy time, okay? And this is also how, you can't see because she's covered with a, a blanket, but her whole body, did I really touch that? <laughs> her whole body was in a C curve, okay? So um, here, we've been working on her for a little bit, and she's not in as much of a C curve, but you can still, I am not gonna touch that this time. You can still see her body is C, but she's not looking so much. This may look like your child. So many of the babies have that same look. Um, and so we start working on getting them to move, unlocking them. Their heads are often stuck in this position. We want to start getting a chin tilt, and then we want to start side flexing so they're able to flex and move to both sides. And interestingly enough, their hips are often stuck as well. And when you begin to work with their hips, what goes back, but the spine comes here and they go back into their position. So we may have mama holding the head after we've stretched that out and we start working with the hip to, to stop those compensations within the kinetic chain. So now, this is the same baby that you saw whose bottom was off the ground in tummy time. Now you're beginning to see she's actually getting some flexibility of the spine. Her head can rotate to either side at this point and she can side flex and now she's more neutral. And you also see the kinesio tape here because we're trying to activate the um, opposing muscles. You also see that she's in um, Ponsetti cast, we're working on club foot at the same time. If you don't do one section and then go to the next, you do the gestalt, you do the whole baby at once and you work on um, everything. So this is another child that you saw earlier as well. What do we see? We see the exact same position of the spine, okay? Her hips are more severe than the first one you saw. So, I mean, that, that is a really flexed hip. So where do you start? You start where you start. You start with the feet, you start with the knees, you do it all together. You can't just address the feet because you can't, you, you can't even get a cast on there if you don't start addressing the knee because you can't extend it enough to get it. So um, this is this little um, sweet pea after she's finished her first bout of casting and now look at her legs, they're straight. So we corrected the feet first. She had a tenotomy with Dr. Feldman in the office. Then we began casting her into knee extension. This is the same child as this child. And this child now is able to get on her belly and we're working on functional activities. I don't know if you can see it here, but we've also got electrical stimulation on her arms at this point to help bring her wrists up. And simultaneously with that, Nelda has been cat or, uh, splinting. Also, let me say that these are Nelda splints. So we do not put these babies in boots and bar like we would put a baby with just idiopathic club foot in boots and bar because their hips and their knees just can't take it and it does not do um, good for them. So we, in our center, our OTs, um, Nelda Fasada, who I'm gonna have come in here now, um, we fabricate these and we fabricate the lower extremity ones together. So she's doing the splint and we're helping to mold and to position. So um, if you wanna say anything to this before we go on to uppers. Oh, hello, hi. Um, my name is Nelda and I would like to say it's been a great honor to working with Dr. Feldman and Fran and Miss Mary and Dale. Um, a lot of the splinting, I do a lot of the splinting here. And actually we use aquaplast material here which is a very moldable um, type of material. And so with this baby here, um, we have bilateral AFOs and we also have knee extension uh, splints to hold the baby in position. And the, the real, um the wonder of this is that we've got an AFO, or a little ankle foot orthosis, to hold the foot in the corrected position, and, and that stays on almost all day. And then you can see on the back of the leg, we have a splint that can be removed and put back on to hold her in that knee extension. So um, there are actually two different splints that fit like hand and glove, 
Okay, we'll go on. Um, this is also that same baby. These are um, some different things that we did to her to help get her here. Obviously, she needed hip flexor stretches. Here you can see that she's got a crease, which is improved at that point, but in the back, because the, the hips were so tight, it pulled on the spine. Anyhow, this is just some of the process. Okay, so I'm going to take a, a back seat, and she's going to go into Okay, so usually when a baby comes into my office, um, things that we will see is the shoulders will be internally rotated, baby will be stuck with wrist flexion, elbow extension, um, and their hands in dwelling thumbs. Um, usually the fingers will be very stiff, very stiff, um, and they'll also have shortened web space. So this baby here, you can see elbow extension, uh, wrist flexion, indwelling thumb, shortened web space. And you can see her thumb in here. And some of the fingers um, will be, uh, uh, they'll have a contracture at the PIP joint. Um, also, they'll be stuck in ulnar deviation. So really the important thing is start stretching and also start splinting as soon as possible. Um, I do typically do not be aggressive. I won't be too aggressive on my first splint. Uh, usually the second splint, I'll be a little more aggressive. Um, and here's a splint, uh, this one here, <coughs> the first picture here, uh, bringing the thumb out, fingers are in extension, and getting the wrist up in, in a neutral position. And then this one here, we have thumb, uh, the thumb abduction. We also have finger spacers to bring the thumbs, uh, the fingers open. Um, okay. I just want to make a comment. Mm -hmm. So we also work on functional tasks. So what do babies do? They, they crawl, right? Most arthrogripotic babies really don't crawl because they don't have that um, position on their wrists. And so she gets so much wrist extension that many of our babies will actually crawl. If we get them young enough, and they'll crawl with their wrists extended, which just changes the whole dynamic. It changes the whole chain and their whole muscular development. Sorry. So you can see here, you know, we're starting off, you can see really where she's really tied in that first web space, um, but just trying to hold her in that position. So usually the splinting, I'll start a splint, uh, and I'll tell the parents in about four to six weeks later, we need to assess her range of motion and if she's gained any more range, I need to capture that and I will resplint again. Um, splints may be every four to six weeks and we're capturing and capturing until the goal is to gain in a functional wrist extension um, so that the child is allowed to, to weight bear and, and be able to weight bear on that hand. So once that wrist comes up from neutral and comes into wrist extension, um, things happen. Um, it's pretty exciting. Um, the child's now able to use their thumb to, you know, to peel a banana. They're now able to hold onto their food, and we start working a lot now with the elbow and, you know, bringing things to, you know, food and, and toys to their mouth. Um, and this little one here, um, you know, this is after many splints, um, you can see where her wrists are now resting. Look at her web space, her first web space. I mean, it's just a, a beautiful picture. This is the web space, for those of you that don't know. So the kids with arthrogryposis almost always have an indwelling thumb, like Nilda talked about. Can you see mine? Mm -hmm. Okay, and so this is almost always how they start, and they don't have the same web space that you and I have, And but she right. and Mary capture amazing things. Okay, um, we talked about this already. I'll just run through here. Actually, I think I'll go on through here. That's a little bit more than this lecture. Um, lower extremities and early intervention. We already talked about that. We're just showing you some of the starting positions. Um, we do talk about doing serial casting, whether it's on extended knees or flex knees, club foot. Um, we use Ponsetti method, but mod modified. One thing we do differently in the early intervention for the arthropodic kids is we cast twice a week and we spend an hour of time stretching every joint in that lower extremity chain um, 
in between casts, and then we reapply the cast, okay? Um, and then we also have the parents doing hip stretches three to five times a day. We also use, if the baby is externally rotated, so if their legs are out and externally rotated and abducted, we use a hip strap, a Velcro strap, to bring them into neutral. Okay. Um, all right, we'll go on. Once that uh, extension, or, or rather correction is achieved, we talked about the splinting. So this is a little child that demonstrates the hip stretch, or uh, the hip, rather, uh, Velcro. Um, and this is that same child um, at about 18 months. So standing independently, feet flat on the ground, and beginning to walk on a walker. Okay, this is the same child you've seen earlier. Um, again, just some examples of the progress that she made. Okay, and this was this little one. Um, when we took off Cass one time, she's actually on mommy's hip for the first time. When she started out with her knees almost by her shoulders, they couldn't even hold her on the side. So what a tremendous difference it made. And then this is the little AFO that Nelda makes and Mary makes. Um, okay, so come on in, mm -hmm. both of you guys. So Dale, you want to go through here? Yeah, this is it. Like this is everything uh, summed up for you. It's start early, get them moving, do some aggressive, progressive stretching. Um, and you must have the passive motion, um, meaning that you're creating that motion before they're gonna be able to achieve or function within that motion. Um, and then gain, gain the motion, maintain the motion through casting or splinting and do no harm. So all the stretching that you're gonna be doing is slow, gradual, progressive, and maintained. So no 30 seconds three times because you're not going to be able to change those muscles. You really, I typically do a stretch for a minute to two minutes at a time, maintaining that um, position. And, and once I feel a little bit of give, I take that, you know, so you're progressively gaining more and more motion. Mm -hmm. And other, one other thing I'd like to just say real quick is, don't forget all of the functional milestones that these babies should be achieving. So, you know, at six months, they should be able to do supported uh, sitting, sitting up by themselves. Now, a lot of them are gonna be delayed in these activities because they're just not in the proper position at the right timing. But we're still working. We're working on head control. We're putting them on their belly, um, even if they hate it, which they will. But that's okay, you keep doing it. You know, you have to remember, and this applies the older your children get. Like, they don't get to decide what's good for them at this age. You get to decide what's good for them and what's needed for them. And yes, it's going to be hard, but it's 110% going to be worth it. Mm -hmm. So still continue to work with them towards their um, functional milestones that they should be reaching. Rolling, pressing up, coming to sit, coming into quadruped. You know, all of those things, you know, even if they're not quite ready for it, that, that's what we're working towards is independence with function. And when we say do no harm, obviously we don't want you to be too aggressive, like we talked about, no rapid stretches, slow progressive ones, but doing harm is also doing nothing. So we hear um, a lot of folks will say, well, just let's, let's see for a year or two. That actually, you know, they're not going to achieve what they could achieve if you just wait on this one. So do some type of motion, get them moving. And then I had a mama say to me the other day, she said, if, if you're not chasing AMC, it's chasing you. So you have to be working on it all the time. Now the final words. Final words. Um, with the splinting, you know, it, it has done amazing, amazing. Uh, and I try to make my splints as comfortable as possible, and I try to avoid any pressure sores, you know, and like Del was saying, yeah, the babies, they may not like the stretches, and they're not gonna like the splints, and initially they are crying, um, but after the child is reaching six, eight months, they had me, they tried to lift their little hand and let me splint them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, that just makes me so happy, because really I want them to be independent and be so functional in their everyday life. Well, now you guys, now you guys know why I work here. <laughs> so, now you all know. I guess now you all know why I work here. It's because um, I think everything they just told you is what we do in um, for arthrogryposis, and it's why it's, this is such a unique place, and why 
we could do so much from around from patients around the world. So I think that um, we could help your we could help you even from afar. We do that very often, and I think there's these resources and this experience of both Dale, Fran, and Aldo is amazing. And just my last my comment is that you know Mary's not here today. Mary had a tragedy in her family and a loss, and we all wish her our best. And she's been here longer than me, and certainly has a vast experience with this as well. And we wish her. And the next time we do this, she is back and working vehemently and ardently for our, for these children. So wishing you all a great January. We will see you in February, probably starting with cerebral palsy as a, that may be just a new topic. We're going to give up arthroposis for a couple of days and go to cerebral palsy next month. But really, I think you can see why these physical therapies are crucial. The first year, please don't ignore them because it makes my life so much easier in the second and third years when we really want to get the function back for these kids. So thank you, and uh, we'll take questions if there are any. I think there's a little delay, so we'll take a second to see if there's any more slides. Oh, we did, it looks perfect. So, um, so basically we'll take some questions if there are any, and really, uh, um, and if there are none, we will just sign off and wish everybody a great weekend. And you know, feel free to email us on, uh, on the sites, and I know you've about 7,800 people watched the last one, Arthur Gryposis, so we hope we can get our outreach to people who are both pregnant with children or expecting children with arthrogryposis to know what to expect and don't fret when the children are born. There are things that can be done and also for new parents who have never even heard of this condition and pediatricians who never heard of this condition. There is hope and there is lots of things you can do, especially in that first year. So uh, have a great weekend. Stay safe, everybody. Stay well. And looking forward to seeing you in person soon. Take care.